the part of this organization called Ukraine Friends and they are providing a lot of different type of help to, to the front line and to civilian people in Ukraine. Welcome, Ms. Katerina. Great to see you. Um, so, um, I was wondering if you could tell our audience a little bit about yourself, where you are right now, and something project you and I are working on. Something o overview, if you don't mind. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ukrainian, first of all. So, so am I. Like, um, about two years ago, I started uh, as a refugee in Poland because I was trying to uh, get my family out of uh, the things that was going on at that time in Ukraine. Uh, I have a mom and a teenage daughter, so uh, I was really scared for their lives and uh, for everything that they feel those days at the beginning of the war so i thought that it's going to be much easier to do something good um uh, a little bit away from ukraine and uh after my arrival to poland uh i was happy to join uh the people who were helping ukrainians and uh, now I'm working with a WeShield company, which is helping Ukraine a lot uh, in different fields. And uh, they have also uh, an organization which is called Worldwide Friends. The part of this organization called Ukraine Friends. And they are providing a lot of different type of help to, to the front line and to civilian people in Ukraine. So I'm very proud uh, to know those people and uh, I'm very proud to work with them because I think that uh, I can do much more as a part of this team that uh, any person can do alone. And uh, I'm very proud to be a part of this uh, wonderful team of people. I, I think it's an amazing uh, thing you're working on. I would say as a team, we are better, stronger together. So the reason we, I think, people connected us, we had mutual friends, uh, about mental health in Ukraine. And so part, my particular focus is trying to help as many people with post-trauma or trauma uh, issues. And I've been trying to actually do that for two years. And I'm, I'm hoping with your help and connections, uh, we'll be able to succeed. And you and I are working on a document that hopefully will get Ukrainian government to help us help the people. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. The point is that we have a lot of connections right now in Ukraine on different uh, government levels even. And uh, one of it is um, Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Health as well. So, uh, and from different type of people like soldiers and civilians and uh, volunteers we know, how important uh, is right now caring about mental health of people because they are struggling a lot uh, and all the things that they can see right now and uh, or they survived through uh, case a lot of damage to the mental health. So uh, PTSD is uh, like a topic team right now in Ukraine because uh, we will have a lot of war veterans, like soldiers. Right. Uh, and uh, this war is really hard and awful in every type of ways it could be. Uh, even uh, one friend of mine, he is an ex-Marine from US. He told me that the things that he saw in Ukraine is not even compatible to the things that he saw in Iraq or Afghanistan. So it's so much it's, more intense? Yes, yeah. everything is much worse. So, uh, as you know, Ukraine uh, was not ready to this war. 
uh, in that way that uh, most of the soldiers who are soldiers right now, they were not professional militaries before war. Right. They was, uh, it was like, uh, you know, just ordinary people who were providing ordinary, normal life, uh, some like uh, IT specialists, drivers, uh, cook, like different type of professions you can imagine. Uh, they were not militaries at all. Maybe somewhere in the past, in the youth, they could have uh, like one year training in uh, army camp, but uh, it's not completely the same. Uh, like you have this environment on a real battlefield with real shellings and dead bodies all around you. And uh, when you can see all those damages that is case to civilian people and to the cities and uh, even animals are struggling, uh, like all that can be alive and happy is, uh, is struggling right now. So it case a lot of damages to the people who were not militaries and uh, they were not even um, ready to see all those things in once they can see in one day even of their life right now. And uh, how many, let me ask you this question, how many Ukrainian people now live in Poland? In, uh, there's a lot of people living on the border from what I understood. We know that uh, about uh, 3 million people was there in Poland at the beginning of the war, but a lot of people uh, uh, moved to another countries from Poland. So, uh, and a lot of people moved back to Ukraine. Oh, yeah. from Poland, they left Ukraine, yeah. they left yes. Poland went back to Ukraine. They are, they are going home back to Ukraine, even from different countries, which was uh, pretty good for living. They don't feel good uh, there, they want to go back. Uh, a lot of uh, people who are going back home is uh, young females with children who have their um, like husbands fighting right. there on a battlefield. So they want to be closer to their family members and uh, they want to uh, like if they have even possibility once in a couple months for a couple of days to see this uh, husband or father of children, they would like to be there and not to be somewhere like in Germany or in Poland or in England or somewhere else, which is much more far away. So, wow. uh, yes. Um, sounds devastating. Ugh. And a lot of people like uh, they didn't used to live abroad. Uh, so they didn't feel uh, very comfortable there. Right. Uh, they used to have a pretty good normal life in Ukraine. And uh, they are trying to restart all the things that they had over again. Because, uh, like, it's about some internal feelings of a person. Uh, they want to be sure that everything is right, that they are speaking their own language and everyone is, uh, everything is around, uh, good known to them, you know? So, uh, if you are moving somewhere abroad and uh, you are preparing to these um, steps in your life, it feels much more different when you are a refugee, just like in the middle of the night, you are taking some stuff of yours and you are escaping from something you are not right. ready to this inner reality at all and you are not ready uh, for living in another country i got you yeah. let me ask another question uh, unfortunately there is no no sunny side to this so i always say i can't stop all the craziness happening in the world but i try to just pick up the pieces as much as possible um, so the question I had for you is, have you, have you had anybody from Kiev or other cities talk to you what it feels like from a mental perspective, 
you know, being any time there could be a rocket, you know, cruise missile, bombing, whatever. What are they what are they telling you that feels like? It's so strange, uh in a bad way, but people used to it. Oh yeah, accommodation, right. Yeah, people accommodate everything. You know, like uh they know that it's dangerous, uh, that uh, no one knows what will be in the next hour. Uh, they know that if sirens, as a, I don't know if you ever have this experience of this sound of sirens, but Jarring. yes, it's it's so like I don't know who produced this sound. <laughs> It, it, it's meant to be jarring so people yes it's so annoying you know like uh so you're you're trying not to be scared but uh all your feelings uh are so bad in that moment uh that uh, no matter what you all try to hide away and uh sometimes people are sleeping they just used to it parents wow yes they just used to it we have, wow. you know, like uh, watch clothes uh, you can wear, and like you can't sleep in your underwear. You can sleep in a bed pajamas because right. in every second on the, in the middle of the night, you should uh, be ready. Then you should uh, run away from your apartment. You know, so uh, yes. completely like different type of reality we have right now. Yeah. So, what kind of mental services do you think that they exist in Ukraine at this point? Anything? Like we some we have some hotlines. Oh, was a psychologist, and uh, was uh, like you can call there and you can talk about your problems and about your feelings. But uh, I don't think that a lot of people uh, used to have these calls so right. uh they are trying to release uh, the stress like uh, speaking to each other you know right self-support yeah. support as a group like yeah. a group support uh, uh. but still you know uh all about the nation i think that uh i can compare it to the people like to the man who is uh injured or like have a his leg broken and but he still keep running because he has well, that, that's my question so here, here's the big question so i i'm writing actually a chapter on resilience right now you know what resilience is of course right so how do you think people because i, I think most people who are not in the middle of war don't quite realize that there are people who are alive and they go about that day you know they they try to keep their family as much as possible. They get food. They can do whatever. How do they think they find strength? Any ideas how people find strength in that type of circumstance? Like, it's because you have no way back. You have no choice, you mean? You have no choice. No choice. Uh, and you can just relax, lay down and relax. You have no choice for it. So Only you're always in the one way direction you keep going, no matter what. But the worst thing is that we don't know when it's going to be over. Right. Exactly. It's the worst thing, you know. I just uh, talked to one friend of mine today and uh, we spoke about that. Even people who is uh, somewhere in jail, they have this kind of uh, term. Sentence will end. Yes. They know that. In a couple years or in a couple months, uh, they were going to be free. So they know the exact date it's going to be. And they are right. waiting for this. It gives them hope. Right. Ukrainians uh, in this war started to lose hope about the predictive date when it's going to be over. Right. We don't know when it's going to be over. And the second thing, which is bad right now, 
we don't know how it's going to be over. Right. Yeah. So we are trying not to think about it. So we are like man who is running on his broken leg. Because the only way for him is to run. Keep running. Keep running, keep going. Yeah. Wow. One, one more question. How are the kids doing through all this? I'm just curious to see how, what are the parents doing? What are the kids doing to actually survive through this craziness? Mm, it depends on the age of the kids. Well, let's say 10. Like uh, when it's young kids, up to 10, up to 7, like young age. Uh, they don't feel it uh, as much as uh, teenage kids feel. Of course. Because, uh, they like, uh, you know, uh, you know, like we used to have this uh, evacuation program at the beginning of the war. So we saw a lot of people with kids uh, going away from the country. It was females, mostly females, because males were not allowed and they still not allowed to leave the country. Right. Only like uh, those who are like old age or have some serious diseases. Right. So... Um, the youngest kid that we moved with those buses was only three days old. Yeah. It was a female from Kharkiv. She escaped from Kharkiv. She gave birth to her son in Lviv. And uh, when she uh, like, uh, went out from the hospital in three days after the birth date, uh, she just uh, stepped into our bus and uh, we moved her to Poland with other refugees. There was 50 people in that bus and she was holding her newborn kid. Yes. So it was the youngest kid, but uh, there was a lot of females with uh, newborn babies, like two months, three months old, half year old. And uh, like we noticed that uh, kids who are like five, six years, seven years even, uh, they feel it like a game, you know? Okay, right now we have a vacation. We are going somewhere in the in bus. Uh, they are looking around, you know? Uh, something new. Yes, yeah, something new. Uh, they don't realize all that horrible things that adults can realize. And uh, what uh, can I say about teenage age kids? It was much worse for them because right. they were losing all the things that they had, uh, like first love, maybe classmates, friends, uh, all that environment that they used to have and uh, which gave them uh, those uh, feelings of home, of friendship, you know. In one day, it was all over. And um, I remember when my daughter was crying, then she wants to go back home. I said, okay, right. if you want, we are packing things and we're moving back home from Poland to Ukraine. Because people are going back home. Maybe How old is she again? She is 15. 15? Yeah. She's adult. And she said, no, you don't understand. I went back home. But I do realize that uh, half of my classmates are away from Ukraine right now. And the mm. things will never be the same. You know, so they yep. uh, they feel this loss right. of the other scenario of reality they could have. Yeah, things that could have been right. Yes, they could have had a exactly. normal life, normal country, normal. Whew. Well, the only thing I you know, it's a, again, what gives me particularly hope is that, and that's why I think hope is important. If you look at so. The, the name of the podcast is Brain, Hope, Reality. 
So I think hope is very important. And if you look at the people who I had in there, so you had the military person, you have mother with child, and you had a kid. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. So one of the, again, that's one of the things hopefully we can figure out uh, to be able to bring at least some of the stuff we do for PTSD. It's not going to fix the war, but what it can do is kind of calm down the body so people are not as stressed out. So that that's basically all I'm trying to do. Um, I got the stuff we do is not addictive, which is great. I'm sure addiction and everything else is going crazy in the country because people are just trying to survive. It's not an option. And you don't know how to navigate it because as you say, the way you're describing it is, uh, it's kind of, it's unpredictable, right? So you can, the next day could be your last or it could be nothing could happen and there's no normality anymore. We are very grateful that you are trying to help us because uh, we have a lot of people with PTSD right now. I think uh, a lot of them, are, um, like they feel all those uh, things which is connected with PTSD, but uh, they uh, uh, they didn't went uh, they didn't go to the doctor, you know. So uh, like they have these feelings. But they are trying to um, get rid of it or survive through this by their own. And right. uh, in a lot of cases, uh, things are getting just worse because right. uh, we still have uh, a lot of influence of um, bad news. And of course, of course. So okay. what? What are the things? What I'm hoping to develop, just to I'm sure you know, and I just want to kind of give you an overview is. What I'd like to do is I'd like to treat, uh, train people, Ukrainian physicians, um, so they can be the trained, trained trainers. So the hope is that when we treat people using the injection that I've, we've been working on for a number of years, is that that would help how people deal with PTSD. Or, and then that will all be sit in Ukraine and the idea is to raise funds to get all the equipment, everything they need, which is not that much equipment, but that could be available for. So you start with the most severe cases. And I've had a lot of experience treating all type of trauma. Uh, nobody from Ukraine so far, but people who were taken into sexual slavery, military personnel, abused women, unfortunately, all types. Human condition is not a pretty circumstance to look at. Uh, but what gives me particular hope is that it's possible to fix the physiology and people can function a lot better, which is it's all about function. Um, and I hope the war stops yesterday, but I, I, I don't know how all that works. I think nobody quite knows all too many factors to predict that the uh, globe is going absolutely crazy. So the only thing I can do is try to help the pieces, make sure that people do as best as they can with current current knowledge. Uh, I think that a lot of people just don't realize uh, how much this part of physiology is taken uh, in this uh, old PTSD things. So they think that it's like, uh, you know, mental health damage because of uh, psychological trauma, but uh, in reality it's not. And I think that the physiological part is uh, even much more important because uh, you can't read, you can't get through of it, you know. Yeah, in fact, I'm sorry, if you, if you can send me your address, just text me your address, I'll send you this, my pen and my book. So it says, it's PTSI. So if you look at that, PTSI, not PTSD. So PTSI means post traumatic stress injury. So the brain actually changes after trauma. And then just to make it pretty obvious is I treated the dog who had PTSD uh, using stellates. So the point is all mammals can develop PTSD. Rats, dogs, probably animals. You're talking about animals not doing well? All the shelling and all this probably gives PTSD as well. We, we talked about this with uh, soldiers and uh, they think that animals are damaged uh, even worse than people somehow, because uh, you know, P 
people uh, know what is going on, but animals don't. So right. they are not ready for this, uh, like shellings and impacts that we have. And uh, they are going crazy, you know. They feel like what scared. happens to them, you know? What, what, what kind of, what, what have the soldiers told you about? Like, um, even one friend of mine from Kyiv, he told me that uh, his dog getting to um, changed a lot after after all the shellings in Kyiv. He was so if it was it's a big dog, some kind of I don't know, uh, like one of big. Uh, so uh, he told me that it was normal good dog. And uh, after all those uh, sirens and shellings in Kiev, this dog is afraid to uh, go outside, which is absolutely not normal for, for dogs who loves to walk around and so on, you know. Yes, they don't want to walk outside or something, uh, even worse things, you know. Uh, we can't, uh, we don't speak their language, so we can't uh, talk to them like, we can talk to people so they can explain us what they feel, you know, but uh, we can see uh, that uh, they are the same survivors that we are through all those trauma things. What's interesting is that biology in a, in a human and a dog is the same. Fight and flight system is the same. So that, that's an interesting description you're, you're providing, which is many human beings hide, right? I'm sure a lot of people don't want to leave their homes either. But to them, at least, they kind of understand that and they can associate sirens and shelling and all the horrible stuff. But it, that's a, I never thought of that perspective. That's a, a very unfortunate perspective. But again, it shows that trauma is unfortunately affects humans more or less and animals as well. Oof. Scary. Well, I usually like to do only 30 minutes. Um, so do you, any final comments you'd like to add? I'd like to hear anything you, you'd like to add. We are, um, first of all, I'm really happy to know you. I'm thank nice. you for everything you are doing and everything you are trying to do and everything that we are hopefully will do in Ukraine uh, because it's really important. You don't even imagine how much is those things are important right now for Ukrainians and uh, like you have a whole nation right now, a big nation, a lot of millions of people who feel this damage and right. uh, uh, like we hope that someday you will come to Ukraine, yes. I'd love to. Oh, absolutely. You know, I was born in Cherkasy, which is out of, outside Kiev. Yes. And so my, my wife said, as long as shelling goes on, you're not allowed to go. But when the shelling is over, I'm going to be there. And uh, we hope that uh, the things that you are doing will help us a lot. I'm going to do everything I can. It feels this hope, you know. We do really feel this hope. We need hope, exactly. Well, we're going to do it. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe.